Alhamdulillah, and we have reached the blessed days of Eid Al-Adha, in the blessed month of Dhul Hijjah. Alhamdulillah, this is a very, very Mubarak time where the heavens and the earth are glorifying Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and we are taught and told to follow them in their glorification. We are taught to repeat throughout these days, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Walillah ilham. And this day is known as a day of sacrifice. Specifically, the Eid al-Adha is known as a time of sacrifice. Many of us are have either already done or placed our orders for our sacrifice or are going after this to literally sacrifice the animal. Or we will be doing so over the course of the next day or two. But what exactly does that sacrifice symbolize? Where exactly did this sacrifice begin? As many of us know, this begins with the story of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salam, that known as the father of this the father of religion, that many of the world religions stem from Ibrahim alayhi salam, the dominant world religions stem from Ibrahim alayhi salam. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam was told after our gone through many tests and many difficulties in his life. He had a son. And most of the scholars say Ismail alayhi salam. And he was told to sacrifice this son. What exactly does that mean? That it came in a dream vision. And the dream vision of the prophets, it's revelation. That he was seen sacrificing his son. Literally taking a thick knife and putting it up against the neck of his son. And originally he didn't quite understand and then it came again. And he realized that this is a command from Allah. It's a very, very difficult command to understand. But it was the station of Ibrahim salam that he was told, this is a sacrifice that you're going to have to do. And so as we all know the story, Ibrahim salam takes his son, Ismail salam up to the top of the mountain. And he begins to prepare him for this situation. Now what is his son? His son doesn't resist. His son doesn't say, whoa, 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 what are you doing? Even, of course, that would be a very logical thing to say. He asks him, and he understands that this came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and he says, he, he submits, he enters into a complete state of submission. And so Ibrahim alayhi salam begins then, this, imagine this action, that a father, a parent, has to literally sacrifice their own child, because God told them to do so, and he's a prophet of Allah. He's one of the foremost of the prophets. And so he begins this action. He begins to place, as he's about to place the knife on the neck of his son, Allah tells him, Qad sadaqta ru'ya. You have fulfilled the vision. You have been truthful to the vision that you received. And Ibrahim and Ismail alayhi salam, his son, is replaced then, as many of the scholars mentioned, with a ram. And so his son is not actually sacrificed but the action and the sincerity that Ibrahim alayhi salam had has literally benefited all of creation since then. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala never tested anybody again with such a command to literally sacrifice their own child. But what exactly, what exactly did he do? First and foremost, Ibrahim alayhi salam, he submitted to Allah's will. We're told many times to do certain things with our religion. We're told to pray. We're told to fast. We're told to lower our gaze. We're told to stay away from certain things. And we have a very, very difficult time submitting. Ibrahim al-Islam was not only had he submitted to all of the other requirements that were put on him, but imagine submitting to such an action. And it was through that sacrifice that his station of submission increased further. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that Ibrahim alayhi salam was an ummah on his own. Imagine the ummah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa The ummah or the ummah of the Anbiya that came before. Millions and millions of people. Ibrahim alayhi salam did not have outwardly thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of followers that were visible at the time. There was a very, very small group, including amongst his own children and progeny. But he was an ummah. Ummah on his own. He was a community on his own. Why? Because of these actions that he did. Because of the state of his heart. Allah says in the Quran that Ibrahim al-Islam had achieved a qalb salim, a sound heart. And so it was through the sacrifices that he made 
and through submitting to Allah's decree that he was elevated. So we have to ask ourselves, how much elevation do we want to achieve in the next life and how much do we sacrifice of the next life for this life? We chase after all of these different things. We're regularly chasing after dunya. We're caught up in things we know we shouldn't be doing. And the, this is the day we reflect, what am I ready to sacrifice? What am I ready to give up in my life? Because of the people who came before me and because of all that they gave up. Look at what came from the blessed progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That you have all of the prophets. You have first and foremost the prophet sallallahu alayhi salam who comes from the progeny of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Then you have all the prophets of Bani Israel in another line. Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam, Sayyidina Yaqub alayhi salam, Sayyidina Yusuf alayhi salam. All of them stem from the prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Ummah on his own because of the sacrifices that he made, because he submitted to Allah's will. He submitted to what Allah wanted him to do, and Allah elevated him. And these practices were not just firm in him. It's not just like you have one person who's kind of on the deen in the family and the rest of the family slipping. No, 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 no. He made sure that these practices and that these stations and that these meanings were inculcated in the hearts of his family. That we know the story of Bibi Hajar alayhi salam or Hagar, that she's told, Ibrahim alayhi salam takes her, and he takes his son to a valley completely barren, complete desert, to the valley of Mecca. And he says, he has a little bit of, in some narrations, a little bit of food and a little bit of water that he gives them. And then he's like, I'm, I'm out. I gotta go. Now imagine you're taking your family, your wife and your and your son, and you're just literally dropping them off. You're like, where are we going? We're going to this valley. What are you going to do? I got to go. Well, that doesn't make any logical sense. Again, you have these commands that are coming that don't really make rational, quote-unquote, rational or logical sense sometimes. Your intellect can't grasp it, but that's because this affair of this deen is more than just about the intellect. It's not just about the brain. This is an affair of the heart. This is an affair of spiritual realities. It's not just about understanding everything. It's sometimes just about Samir now wa Fatna. We hear and we obey. And so naturally, say the Hajar alayhi salam, she's worried what exactly is, is going on. She doesn't, you know, lose her pool. She doesn't trip out. She asks. She clarifies. So what exactly are you doing? Did, and then she asks, did Allah command you to do this? He says, yes. What does she say? No, no, no. Plead with Allah that you take us away from here that that, that this is going to be really, really difficult on us. We're not going to be able to stay in the desert by ourselves. She doesn't say any of that. She says, he says, I am leaving you in God's care. And she says, I am satisfied with Allah. But she submits to Allah. And he leaves. And now she's in this valley. And eventually, the food that they have, everything that they have, runs out. And she has a young child with her. And now her own test begins. Her own test begins. And so she's out looking for food, looking for water, but this is hot. If anybody's ever been to Mecca, it's hot and no AC at this time. You don't have the fancy buildings and everything that they have now. We're talking complete barren desert. And she's in between these two mountains, Safa and Marwa. And so what does she do? She doesn't just sit there, only sit there and start making dua. No, she actually does both. She starts to first and foremost put in her, her effort while ultimately relying on Allah. I mean, conceivably, you can't actually see anything. There's no water in sight. There's no food in sight. You just have these two giant sand mountains. Doesn't make any sense. Why would you even waste your time looking for food or looking for water? Again, because logic is not what guided these people. The intellect is not the only thing that guided them. You're talking about spiritual realities. They had a trust in Allah. If God told him to leave me here, God is going to take care of me. God is going to make something come and he's going to take care of it. So what does she start to do? As we know the story, she's running back and forth between Safa and Marwa. She's running back and forth between these two mountains in the heat of Mecca. Very, very completely in a disheveled, broken state before our Lord. She wasn't in this like, yes, there is a trust in Allah, but ultimately she was realizing her state of submission before Allah, that I am a servant to Allah. And Allah will do with me what he wills. Because inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. That we come from Allah and to Him we are going to return. And so what then happens? She's running back and forth, running back and forth. 
And eventually, as she's expressing her brokenness before Allah, boom, an angel comes and strikes a rock. And we know as the well of Zamzam that we know from today, if we go to Mecca and you're able to drink from that blessed water, Zamzam starts to pour forth. Again, out of, completely out of nowhere, because nowhere would she know that, yeah, the angel's going to come, there's going to be a, a whole thing that's going to happen, and then all this water is just going to come. No, she is doing, she's putting in her part. She first and foremost, she submitted to what Allah asked of her. Which he revealed it through a prophet, which was Ibrahim alayhi salam, and she submitted to it. That's the first thing that happened. The second thing then is she starts to put in effort, and she starts to place her trust in Allah. But the effort is still there. So we, we learn from this that when you are being patient and when you are trusting in Allah, you still have to put in outward effort. You can't just resign yourself and wait for things to happen. There has to be a moment of effort, but you're not relying on your effort. You're relying on the Lord of your effort. You're relying on your Lord. That is the lesson that we learn from her. Look at these meetings. Look at these people. And we have to wonder, where are we with regards to these meanings? That these were our... Our, our, the people who preceded us, our forefathers. Where are we with regards to following their example? She then shows her brokenness and her weakness before Allah, and then Allah does what? He gives her a way out. Because he says in the Quran, from that whoever has taqwa of Allah, whoever is conscious of Allah, whoever follows Allah's commandments, whoever places their trust in Allah, Allah will give them an exit strategy. That he will provide for you from where you never expected. Because all these means, they're in Allah's control. If you're sick and you think that there's no cure possible, don't worry if the doctor says that. Don't worry if someone says you're never going to get better. Don't worry if someone says that life, your life is going to end in a year or two years or the same thing is happening to your family members. Place your trust in Allah. Turn to Allah. Rely on Allah. And Allah will give you a way out. If it's best for you, Allah will give you a way out. If someone is struggling financially, fool us into thinking that these people and their fancy cars and their fancy homes and the fancy jobs and all these sorts of things nothing wrong with having nice things but that's not the goal you see when Allah honored them he didn't give them the giant mansions and giant cars where they put them on camels and things like that at the time no he gave them immense stations such that this is a woman who every single year we replicate her action at Hajj and every single day there are people doing Umrah Thousands, thousands, hundreds of thousands. Inshallah, Allah open up Mecca again for all the people to visit. Millions of people are replicating her action. But replicating her action in outward form is not enough. You have to replicate the inward as well. There has to be an inward reliance on Allah. That how many, how much of our life are we going to live or we rely on all these other things and we don't place any of our trust in Allah. So that is the main lesson that we take away from this. And then there's the lesson of sacrifice. They sacrificed everything so you could be here today, so we could be here today. So much. And we have a difficult time sacrificing a little bit of haram. That we're going to sacrifice an animal today. Where are we with sacrificing the animal soul inside of us? The nafs al-amara, the evil commanding soul inside of us that tells us to look at haram things, it tells us to drink haram things, it tells us to smoke haram things, it tells us to do all sorts of things that we shouldn't be doing. Where are we with sacrificing that inside of us? That is the question we should be asking today. How much are we ready to sacrifice for this deen? Because this life is, is pretty short. It's going to pass. And are people going to remember you as an ummah on your own? Is that the station? that someone achieved because of their sacrifice, can we try to at least live the realities or li attempt to live those realities? Or are we just, do we just want to be remembered as just any old person? We have to keep us caught up. Keeping us caught up, whether we're fighting with people, whether we're arguing with people, whether we're missing our prayers. These are all desires, shahawat, that keep us bogged down. And it's at every level of this deen, different desires are there. It doesn't mean if someone has stopped the major sin that they don't have desires. Sacrifice continues. There are people who sacrifice their desires. From there, they begin to sacrifice their time for the sake of the deen. And then you have the people who literally sacrifice their life for the sake of this deen. If the Sahaba Ikram, the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu they sacrifice literally everything so that you and I could be here and worship Allah everything so that we can say la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. We know the stories of them sacrificing their wealth. We know the, how much money they gave in the cause of Allah. We know how much time they devoted. 
But how many of us reflect upon the fact that many of them literally sacrificed their very life so that we could sit here today and worship Allah? And you have the story of Sayyidina Jafar ibn Abi Talib, eventually known as Sayyidina Jafar al-Qayyar, radiallahu anhu, that there was a battle and the Prophet sent them on an expedition, the Battle of Muta' in, in the area of Jordan. And the Prophet and many of the Sahaba are still in Medina. And in the narration it comes that Sayyidina Jafar, he was bearing the standard. He, was bear- the, he had the standard in his right hand. So he's fighting this battle, he's bearing the standard, and then what happens? His hand gets cut off. His right hand gets cut off. His arm, rather. He moves it over to the left hand. He doesn't stop fighting. He keeps going. He's still fighting the kuffar. He keeps going. He has the standard now in his left hand. Next thing what happens? His left hand is cut off. His left arm is cut off. He's still fighting valiantly, sacrificing himself, doing what he can because he has this internal reality that I need to spread this deen. His left hand gets cut off. What does he do? He holds it up in between his, his arms, whatever he has left of his arms until he can't do it anymore. And then he's wounded, severely wounded. The Sahaba, they take the standard from him, they pull him to the side. They count 80 wounds all on the front of his body from swords, from spears, from arrows. No wound on his backside. Why? Because he never turned around. He kept going. No matter what, he said, I'm, this is it. I'm going for it. He sacrificed everything. Imagine 80 wounds. This was, and this was like real, real, real battle. This wasn't gunshots and, and, and drone strikes. No, these people were fighting with their, with their swords, with their spears, right in their faces. 80 wounds they count. They offered him water. They said, drink some water, O Jafar. What does he say? I'm fasting. I'm, I'm not going to drink water. I'm fasting. He says, I hope to break my fast in paradise. And that's exactly what happens. That at the time, the Prophet ﷺ is sitting in Medina Munawwara. And the Sahaba who are there, they see the Prophet ﷺ say, Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And he, then he starts to begin speaking to somebody. And they're not understanding what's going on. After the gathering, they ask him, Ya Rasulullah, who are you speaking to? He said, that was Jafar ibn Abi Talib, who was in front of me with a group of angels. Allah replaced his arms with two wings, with which he can fly with wherever he wants in paradise. And he came, where he was in paradise, who did he come to visit? Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because of his love for the Prophet ﷺ. He came and he visited the Prophet ﷺ, and the Prophet ﷺ saw him, so he became known after that as Jafar al Qayyah. Look at what these people did. They sacrificed everything for us, and they did not do this so we could just sit around. That's not the purpose of our life. We have to literally think, when we're caught up in whatever we're caught up in, that how much have people who've gone before me, the likes of Zabai Ibrahim al-Islam, the likes of the Sahaba, so many Sahaba we could mention, stories of each and every single one of them and how much should they sacrifice. Did they sacrifice all this so we could just waste all our time on Netflix watching this show after this show and just sitting around letting our life pass by? Is that the, is, was that why they sacrificed? Is that what we should be doing on, when we reflect on their life sacrifices? Did they sacrifice it so we could spend our time arguing as a community over small little differences and not actually making any progress? Or so that we could just work, work, work for our dunya, focus only entirely on our career, amass a lot of money but do nothing for the sake of this deen? Why did they sacrifice so much? That's the question that we need to be asking. Is it just so we can hang out all the time and socialize? Is that the purpose? There is deep wisdom as to why the Sahaba Ikram sacrificed so much. And it's so that we, just a small portion, we could take and we could continue the work that they did in some way or another. And there is a lot of work to be done and a lot of sacrifices to make. A few years on Eid, Amir Sundiata, may Allah bless him and preserve him, that he gave a khutbah and he mentioned how much work has to be done in this community, how many people are struggling, how many people are thirsty for guidance, they're begging for guidance. What responsibility then do we have? Everybody here has some talent or another. Everybody. It doesn't mean everybody has to be involved outwardly in spreading the cause of the deen, but everybody has some talent. We have to ask ourselves, why? what are we doing to use our talents, to use our services, to use what Allah has blessed us in the service of this religion? And how are we going to sacrifice some portion of our time, some portion 
of what we can do so that we can continue the great work that the people who came before us did. Allahu Akbar, 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 Wallahi Alham, Alhamdulillah, Allahumma Salli wa Sallam, Mubarak ala Sayyidina Muhammadin, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, kama salaita ala Sayyidina Ibrahim, wa ala alihi Sayyidina Ibrahim, inna ka hamidu majid. And so it was through these sacrifices that these people attained the station of complete, complete submission. We're not always in a state of submission, but we gotta wonder, when God's rules come down, how often are we questioning, why do I gotta do this, why do I gotta do that, why do I do this, why do I gotta wear this? What happened to this state of, the one who created me told me to do it, so I'm gonna do it. And I'll find out, sometimes you just gotta find out later, why exactly did I have to do that? Nothing wrong with asking questions, but there's something beautiful about submitting to what God wants from us. And God wants something general from all of us, and then he wants something specific from each one of us. And that is the relationship we have to ask him. Ya Allah, what do you want me to be doing? What should I be doing with my life? How should I be spending my life? Whether I'm engaged outwardly in work, if I'm working here, if I'm constructing something, if I'm working at a job, if I'm a doctor, if I'm a lawyer, whatever it is, but what else do you want from me? Because surely I know what you don't want from me is to just come home every day, sit on a couch, let my time pass by for five, six hours, and then the weekend comes, and then all I do is socialize and hang out or hang out online, and then the weekday starts and I just keep repeating. That, that much we can all say that's not what God wants from us. So what does he want from us? First and foremost, we know he wants us to submit. And he wants us to submit to the rules of this deen. That's a hard thing to do in this society, that everybody... It's an unpopular word to say submission, but the Muslim is the one who submits. Islam is the religion of submission. And through submission, you attain the state of peace and the state of tranquility. Allah says in the Quran, referring to the Kaaba, that we made this house a place of security. And then he said, and take the Maqam Ibrahim, the standing place of Abraham as a place of prayer. Imam Al-Qushayri, Rahimullah, he mentions about this verse, that the station of Ibrahim a.s., in addition to the physical station that is there in Mecca, is the station of attaining a state of complete submission, turning your affairs over to Allah. You submit outwardly to the rules, and then inwardly you resign your affair over to Allah. What does that mean? We let go of our desires, and then from there, we begin letting Allah run our life. We say, Ya Allah, you are in control, ultimately. I'm going to turn my affair over, over to you. That was the station of Ibrahim al-Islam when he was young. Many of the commentators mentioned he was very young when this happened. And he was trying, to, he was confirming Tawheed, demolishing the idols. And there was a very, very, very dark and evil ruler there at the time. And he built this huge fire and he said, we're going to burn Ibrahim in the fire. And so... They, what do they do? They build a giant fire and they build a huge catapult. And they put Ibrahim Islam in the catapult and then they're all watching this. It's like this giant ceremony and they begin catapulting him. They release it and he begins flying through the air and going towards the fire. At the time that he's going towards that fire, what happens to him? Sayyidina Jibreel Islam, the angel of revelation comes to him. And he says, is there anything that you need? He says, as... As for from you? No. My Lord is aware of this situation. I resign my affair over to Allah. Now there would have been nothing wrong with you, Allah, who's sending Sayyidina Jibril Islam. You're talking about, of course, God is the one sending him, asking him, do you need anything? But he said no, because he was in a complete state at this point of submission and trust in Allah. Complete submission. And you see this theme throughout his life, this theme of submission. And he resigned the affair completely over to Allah. And he said, Hasbun Allah wa ni'mal waqeed. And Allah says to the fire that become cool and peaceful for Abraham. As we know in the verse in the Quran. That he goes into the fire and it becomes completely cool and peaceful. And some of the commentaries, like a bed of roses. And he mentions in his life that some of the best days of my life were the days that were when I was in there. Because he did what? Again, all logic and the intellect, it doesn't, doesn't make sense. You get catapulted into the air, there's a ginormous fire, you're about to be completely burned. 
this angel comes to you and asks me if you need anything, you're like, nah, I'm good. Because God knows what I'm going through already. Hasbunallah wa ni'mal wakil. And that is when we are struggling, when we are going through something. I mean, if an angel comes to you, you know, no problem asking them. But that's the station of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that he completely trusted in Allah. He had completely resigned his affair over to Allah. And so we need to see things as coming from Allah. That test came from Allah. The test of sacrificing his son came from Allah. The test of leaving his wife and son in the desert came from Allah. All of this is from Allah. Even if it's coming outwardly from people, ultimately it's coming from the Lord of people. And so we just need to see what exactly is Allah testing us with and how are we going to go about submitting. And the more we sacrifice, the more you sacrifice internally, the more desires you sacrifice, the more you give up haram in your life, the more your heart enters a state of submission. The heart is, it is possible for the heart to submit. But the more the spiritual heart enters, but the more we're caught up in desires, the more we're caught up in our lusts, the more we're caught up in haram, the more we're caught up in doing things we shouldn't be doing, in saying things we shouldn't be saying, in dressing in a way we shouldn't be dressing, in looking at people that we shouldn't be looking at, in all sorts of things, the more difficult it's going to be for the heart to be in a state of submission and to be in a state of contentment. And so Allah, the Prophet told us, and Allah commands us in the Quran, that when you are struggling with these things, seek help in patience and in prayer. Because you don't know what's good for you. Allah says, Asa tabru shay'an wa huwa khayrun lakum wa asa antuhibbu shay'an wa huwa sharrun lakum wa allahu ya'lamu wa antum la ta'lamun. That perhaps you hate a thing and in it is much good for you. And perhaps you love a thing and in it is much bad for you and Allah knows and you don't know. Ultimately, God knows what's good for us. God knows what's going to be best for us. And outwardly, something might appear like this is really, really damaging. This is really, really difficult. But that doesn't mean that's the inward reality. And so as we contemplate these stories of the greats who came before us, as we reflect on this day of Eid al-Adha, the day of sacrifice, we have to think how much are we ready to sacrifice. We should all make an intention right now that we want to sacrifice something for the sake of Allah. We want to sacrifice something for the sake of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We want to sacrifice something for the sake of all the greats who came before us, everything it is that they did for us. Whether that's something haram that we're doing, and if we stopped a lot of the major things, then some portion of our time to do the work of this deen, to do the work of trying to help people, whatever it is, we are living in a community where there's a lot of help that's needed. Let's make that intention. Let's try to form a deeper relationship with Allah. One that's not just that when we need something, we ask, but one that's, you are my Lord, you created me, I'm at your service. We say in these moments, when you are at Hajj, la bayt Allahumma la bayt. Here I am at your service, my Lord, la bayt. We should turn to Allah and say, Labbaik, here I am at your service, my Lord. Whatever it is that I can do, I'm ready to do. But it begins with submitting. It begins with sacrificing. It begins with leaving the haram. It continues, continues with leaving the things that Allah wouldn't like, the makruh. And it continues with leaving things that we just waste our time. And it continues then with us spending as much time as we can in spreading goodness, in spreading khair, in spreading nur, in spreading this deen, in doing whatever portion we can to bring good to the society that we're, lit, that we're in. And that will be the route, inshallah, that allows us to attain a station of nearness to Allah, a station of love of Allah, a station of love of the Messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and a station where Allah and His Messenger, inshallah, are pleased with us. In Allah, wa malaikum to be ala nabi Ya ayu al-lazina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallam wa tisayma Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar wa lillahi alhamd Allahumma fili al-mu'minin al-mu'minat wa al-muslimin al-muslimat Ya Allahum al-Rahmin We ask Ya Allah on this noble day Ya Allah that you accept whatever sacrifices we are trying to make Ya Allah that you accept the actions that folks did in the month of the Hijjah, Ya Arham Rahimin, Ya Allah, and that you bless us, Ya Allah, to be able to make Hajj and to visit your house, Ya Arham Rahimin, and that you pardon all of our sins, and that you elevate us, and that you increase us, and that you accept us, and that you forgive us inwardly and outwardly. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakat ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. La ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, wa lillahi alham. Alhamdulillah, wa lillahi alham. Alhamdulillah, wa lillahi alham.